Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. So, um, do you have had a few wild dreams? I don't know. Like some of the dreams I've had, people have said they're from God. Some people have prophesied, right? And it's excited. I've got some monkeys in my head. I don't know about you, but I've got like three or four monkeys with symbols, you know, and, and, uh, and I had this idea, you know, I, that, that, I, that it'd be, you know, one of the monkeys must have said, Dave, it'd be good if you're on telly. And the other monkeys agreed with it. And I thought, on telly, it, 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 it did something to me. I thought, I'd love to be on telly. You know, and just, to, it was partly to escape the ministry. Ministry's hard work. <laughs> telly looks great. And so I thought, well, I'm going to have to come up with an idea, you know, because I'm going to have to come up with a, a pilot project. And then I came up with this idea, the Great British Generosity Experiment, right? It's politically incorrect now, right? But I'll tell you what I did. And it's called Cheeky Beggar, right? The Great British Generosity Experiment. And I wanted to find out how generous the great British public actually are. And, uh, and I thought, I, I, I was wondering how much beggars actually make on the streets of London. I thought, how much do charity workers, you know, uh, make on the streets of London? And, and then I thought, I'll compare uh, London to, to Scotland, because Scottish people are renowned to be quite tight <laughs> with their finances. And then compare Britain to, to maybe France, and then, then fly over here. You know, and maybe then, then maybe someone can grab the pilot, you know, and I could become a, a Hollywood star. It's just all the monkeys were agreeing with me at that stage. <laughs> Anyway, I thought, who will I get as a beggar? I thought, I'll be the beggar. And so I dressed up as a beggar, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I hit the streets of London. I went to, if you've been to London, I went to Covent Garden. And I sat down there with my sign, I need money. And uh, it, was, it was going on for about 43 minutes. And then these two pairs of black shoes came up. And they, they said this, you got the right to remain silent. Anything you say could be used against you in the court. I was nicked. Two police officers. They sent me to jail. <laughs> they put me in the back of a paddy wagon and they drove me to, to a jail. And they, they said to me, and I said, no, 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 I'm doing, I'm doing a, a pilot, TV pilot. And then he said, well, where's your crew, right? Every one of the crew had run out into the crowd. There was a, not one of them stood by me. Not one of them. There was about eight of them, right? They all disappeared. And they said, yeah, they pull another leg, mate. Get in the paddy wagon, right? And they took me to, to, and I was there for, I don't know, because I infringed apparently the law of 1880 that you're not allowed to beg in London. Everyone else is doing it. <laughs> Everyone else is doing it. But, but I got nicked for doing it. And I've got to say, my wife said, are you sure it's legal? The night before to, to beg in London, I, I, and I just, you know, like a typical husband, in one ear, out the other ear, didn't even answer. <laughs> answer. It was the most embarrassing, em, embarrassing phone call I've ever made. You know, oh, it was a terrible feeling. So, and I got out, right, went to a cheap store, bought a, 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 a Hawaiian shirt, right, and I got a shaker thing for a hospice, and I thought, I'll just find out how much, how much I could make uh, raising money as a super cheeky charity worker. I did that for a while, right? And then I went to the Strand and uh, I went to a suit place and I said, can I, can I borrow a suit for a week? I'm doing a TV pilot. They said, yeah, pick any suit you like, right? And so I came out in a boss suit, right? Super slick, super sleek, you know, incredibly good looking in my boss suit. Went outside the Bank of England, started raising money. And I, I was kind of like telling people, hey, I'd, I'd like no less than a fiver, you know, just, just let's start with that, you know, and I just, and, and, and finally the results came in, right? And uh, if, I'd, if I'd done begging, if I was able to do begging for a, a whole year, I, I'd be on uh, approximately $5,500 a year. As a, as a super cheeky charity worker in a Hawaiian shirt, if I did that for a year, I'd be on $65,000 American dollars a year. 
as a super slick, super sleek charity worker, if I did that for a whole year and took time out from some, for some holidays in Spain, I'd be on $225,000 a year. Wow. I'm going back there. <laughs> it's, it's the same people walking past. It's just a different attitude. Same, same environment, just a different attitude. And it seems to me there's a universal principle that your attitude determines your altitude. I would say that's a universal law. Henry Ford said, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're both right. And then if you adapt that to Christianity, if you think you can, there's a possibility that you can. But if you think you can't, you absolutely can't. I'm here to break strongholds in this place tonight. You know, I'm here to get you into the flow of awakening, the flow of the anointing of God, and, and get your negativity, send it back to hell. I'm here to see God crack you open tonight. I didn't, you know Roger Bannister was the first man in, in human history to, to run a mile in less, than, in less than four minutes, you know. There was some other guy in the back of India getting chased by a tiger, but it was unrecorded. <laughs> but he's the first guy in all of human history to run a mile less than four minutes. Well, in the next six years, 200 people did it. What is that? What is that? That's a barrier. That's a mental barrier. That's not a physical barrier. That's a mental barrier. They didn't think they could do it, so they didn't do it. It's the same with your life. All men live under the same skies, but not all men have the same horizons. Some of you, your horizon is so close to where you live because of the attitude which you nurture. And it needs to be changed. And I want to say tonight, the Bible goes there. It's not just a universal principle. It's a biblical principle. Let me take you through the book of Romans. Just, and let me, let me start with the book of Romans uh, talks about faith, right? It's beautiful. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says the just will live by faith. So faith's not a hotel motel. Faith's not a camping ground. Faith is a residence, a permanent residency. You don't live by faith if you're about to do some major project. You live by faith 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months of the year. This is permanent residency. We the just shall live by faith. They'll reside in faith. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, it says that, that, that against all hope, in hope, Abraham believed, and he so became. He, so it's saying that the currency of, of, of breakthrough is faith. That if you've got the currency, which is faith, then you can open up the vaults of heaven through faith. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse number 2, it, it says that by faith we enter into grace, which is God's riches, which includes all of his provision. It includes all of his mercy, all of his goodness. How do we enter in? Through faith. But you know, the Bible does a weird thing. The Roman road of faith does a weird thing. Because once you hit chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, hey, I need you to get transformed. How are we going to do that? By a renewing of the thinking process. So that you can test and approve God's good, His pleasing and perfect will for your life. Well, what, what, why would it now shoot up to the mind? Why would it say, you know, if you want to test and approve, it's like if you want to test drive a Maserati. That's what it's saying. God's will's like a Maserati. It's, it's, it even says that it's perfect. But to test and approve it, to test drive it, you need to have a renewal of the thinking process. You can't bypass that. You need to be transformed by renewal of the thinking process, by test driving, in order to test drive the will of God. 
the magnificent will of God for your life. So it's not just what you believe that counts. It's what you think about what you believe that counts. Unity isn't when all the churches in San Diego get together. Sometimes it's horrible. (laughs) Unity is when you come together. When you line yourself up with your convictions. Some of you are misaligned, so that's why I'm here tonight. You misalign. You you think not what you believe. Unity is when the conduct of your hand lines up with the confession of your mouth that lines up with the commitments of your mind that lines up with the conviction of your spirit. And that's where, that's where God commands a blessing. That's unity. When the conduct of your hand comes into line with the confession of your mouth, that comes into line with the commitments of your mind, that comes into line with the conviction of your spirit. That's what God blesses. And some of you say, yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah, but you don't think what you believe. You think something different. And I'm going to use a trendy word right now, but there's a reason why God needs to change your mind, and it's to do with sustainability. In that most Christians only ever experience one move of God in their lives. Because after that, the vessel cracks. After that, the vessel erodes. After that, the fragility of the vessel that isn't fashioned by Christ becomes like a worn-out plastic cup. And God's trying to create in you a vessel that will last a lifetime. And I'm going to say it's slow going. You know, when when God, when Jesus said to said to Simon, from now on you're going to get called Peter. Well, I know what he's saying. You no longer be a reed, you're going to be a rock, you know. But you know, sometimes he's Simon Peter, sometimes he's Peter, sometimes Simon. Never Peter Simon for some strange reason. But the guy who got up in Acts chapter two, where three thousand people got saved. That ain't Simon, that's Peter. So it took him three years to be transformed with the renewing of the mind from when he was prophesied to being Action Jackson and seeing 3,000 people. See, it's it's a slow process. But God doesn't want you to be like, like vanilla ice. He doesn't want you to start singing Ice Ice Baby. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want you to be like the four non-blondes. He doesn't want you to be a one-hit wonder. He wants you to be like Coldplay. I mean, how many years ago did they write Yellow? I mean, it's a dumb name. I still don't understand it, but it's a great tune. And it's like 25 years ago. And then they had the scientists. And, and then they had sky full of stars. Then they had fix me, fix you. Let's just fix some stuff. And then, then they had magic. And then, and then they, they, they just having hit after hit. The latest hit is a song called Pray. But they're legends. Most people are one-hit wonders because their second song's identical to the first song. We heard that song last month, so you can get lost. (laughs) And some of you are too predictable. God wants you to change. He wants you to morph. He wants there to be a different rhythm, different melody. He wants wants you to reinvent yourself. And that's all to do with the thinking process, all to do with the mind. He doesn't want you to be three steps forward, four steps back. And there's a lot of people, as I said, they experience one move of the Spirit of God, then they talk about it for the rest of their lives. How dull. Yeah. Oh, man, alive. I yeah. never want to be. I, want, I don't want to be in a show called, called Where Is He Now? Yeah. <laughs> you know, along with Right Said Fred. <laughs> I, I want to be on a show called Where Will He Be Next? prepping for it I'm prepping for it so you know let me give you let me give you the science of it right that faith comes by hearing from God so this is uh, Romans 10 17 so faith comes by hearing from God so when you hear from God faith's created now faith in one respect splits into two 
So faith enters in. It, it goes two ways. Firstly, it enters into your heart. It's the check of faith. It's signed in the blood of Jesus. It's got your name on it. It's got a promise on it. It's got an amount on it. It's got a date on it. But once you've got it, it makes you richer than Hollywood. Because you've got the check of faith. It makes you like a lottery winner. You've got all your numbers. It's already, that's why faith initially isn't a verb. It's a noun. It's not something you do. It's something you have. It's a confidence. I am who says God says I am. I, 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 he is who he says he is. He'll do what he says he'll do. It's an utter confidence, an unshakable confidence. It's a check. It's not a large charity check. You know, those ridiculous charity checks just to show off how much they're giving, right? I, if faith was a person, it'd be a six-year-old. It, it'd be wearing shorts, never needs to wear long trousers. You know, never goes to the gym. Why would it need to muscle up? Because it knows it's a key to open the door to power. And you don't need a large key. That's why you never, you never quite feel like, have you got enough faith? Because it's not the size of the key that counts. It's the authority of the key. You, you're rich. You're rich. Rich. You don't need size. Even Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you don't need more faith. You do need less doubt. But you don't need you don't need more faith. Outside the, the door of your heart is an old Chevy. It's the old Chevy of prayer. And you know, I'm diverting here, but most people think that prayer is a Mercedes. They think that prayer is a beamer. They think a, a prayer is the is the, the top class Tesla, right? But it's none of those things. No one's a professional prayer. If they are, they shouldn't be so elite. That all of us, prayer is just putting some words together and the Holy Spirit being involved. And the only purpose of prayer is to take the check of faith to the bank of grace. Uh huh, that's it. So once you are at the bank of grace, the teller, who's, who's the Holy Spirit, he's everywhere, right? He says, What you got there? So I got a check. He never says, How long did it take to get here? He never peeks around the corner. What kind of car did you drive? How good are your prayers? Because prayers were meant to be ordinary, empowered by the gift of the extraordinary. And so never feel like that you, you know, I'm an amateur prayer. Never feel like you're missing the, the eight ball. Never feel like you, you're missing it when you, when you feel quite ordinary. Ordinariness is what God loves. That's why he started and came into Jerusalem on a donkey, but not even the foal of a donkey. God loves ordinary. Once you stop feeling ordinary, you're in big trouble. But the second place that faith goes to is in your mind. Because when, when someone says, how do you know you're saved? Well, you, you go, oh, hey, I know that I know. What are you doing? You're saying, I, I know that I know. It's a twice knowing. You've got a conviction in your spirit. I, I really believe this stuff. But you've also got knowledge within your mind. And when you receive faith from God, he, he sees a pathway in your mind between two points as the crow flies. Previously, before you heard from God, you, you thought, yeah, the battle belongs to God. But it was as a river meanders. It wasn't really revelation, it was cognitive information. Yeah, I believe the battle. But once God says to you, the battle belongs to me, it's like you see it a pathway between two points with your mind as the crow flies. And now he says, it's over to you. The more you walk the path, the wider it gets. The more you confess scripture, the more you conduct yourself according to your confession, the wider the path gets. And it's happening. The more you walk on it. And then it gets, it gets wide enough where God says, I'm just going to lay some tracks down. I'm going to lay some, some tracks down. And you think, God, what are you doing? I'm going to lay some trains of thought here. Created trains of thought. And the whole energy system of your mind runs on trains of thought. It's how it works. But the trains need train tracks. And train tracks need width. 
and with this created through your confession and through your obedience to God. Inside every person's mind are fields of dreams, floods of emotion, trains of thought, and cities of habit. The skyline of your mind will determine the skyline of your future. We don't create the future, but we miss the future that God's created by not overlaying a plan of the renewing of the mind. And inside your mind, there are three regions to your mind. There's the fallen mind, there's the natural mind, and there's the new mind that you only get when you're born again. And each one of those regions of the mind has skyscrapers. In the, in the fallen mind, there's three areas to it. There's the royal cities, the hardest ones to beat, filled with self-righteousness, filled with selfishness, filled with self-pity. They're the self-cities. They're the narcissistic cities, the, the Kim Kardashian cities. But then just below them is what I call the industrial cities. These are the attitudinal cities. These are the industrial factories pumping out moodiness. Do you know, we do call people a moody cow. I don't, but some people do, right? But it's because of the industrialization of the darkened part of their mind. There's the toxic gases of jealousy, the toxic gases of envy, the toxic gases of hatred. And the more you fuel the fires in the furnaces in the industrial cities, the more toxic the air becomes. The stronger the city becomes. It gets financially viable to build another skyscraper. And then below them is what I call the historic cities. And these are the cities that we think naturally sin lies. We, we don't see that, that self-pity is, is a sin or cowardice is a sin. But, but we do see that in the historical cities, there's greed. In the historical cities, there's deceit. In the historical cities, there's, there's, there's immorality. There's lust in the historical cities. And each one of these cities, depending on your past, has a skyline. And God realized it's going to take a little bit of time to demolish the cities in the darkened part of your mind. But God's patient. God knows this is a process of change. Miracles are instant, but transforming the mind is process. And you want to believe for miracles at the same time as believing that this process, I'm being transformed by the ruining of the mind. Don't give up wanting to be changed into the image of Christ. And you know, I'll just say why it's so difficult. Because when, when God puts the new mind within you, there's no cities in it. You know what I got saved? You know, I, I still did some things immoral. Because all I've got in me is I've got old historic city. But I get a new mind that has the markings of nine new cities. And these are the previews of the fruits of the Spirit. So there's the markings for the city of peace, for the city of goodness, for the city of faithfulness, for the city of self-control, for the metropolis of love. They're all marked out. And the more you feed them, Every train of thought takes building material, either to the darkened part of your mind or to the new part of your mind. It's your decision which way it goes. The more you send trains to your new mind, the more building material arrives on the earth of the city of peace that God can now build with. It comes down to you. But the skyline of your mind, will determine the skyline of your future. You can have some one-off things happen, but not sustained, cold play, legendary success. God can be kind to you. God could buy, even bypass the process for a while. But if he bypasses it for too long, it'll destroy you. We're not made for the power of God. 
We're not made for the glory of God to be invested within us. And so God needs to transform us so that we're made for power. We're made for, for authority. Every train leaves from the Grand Central Station of the will. And let me just give you a little, little example, right? Here's, 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 I'll just make up an example that, that everyone else has been invited to the party next Saturday except for you. <laughs> you figured it out. You, you, you've rung around. But somehow you, now you're off the list. And every obs observation comes with a perceptiveness that, that just inquires why, why, why. And you arrive at Grand Central Station of the Will. And the station master of the fallen mind, Satan, says to you, it's because nobody wants you anymore, buddy. And then he says, in actual fact, no one's ever wanted you. They've just had you because they've had to have you. But now it's voluntary. They don't want you anymore. We're on a train to the city of rejection. First stop, self-pity. Toot, toot, all aboard. And that's your death march. Satan's yelling at me all the time, but the difference between temptation and acting upon temptation, which is disobedient. On the other side of the platform... Holy Spirit is the station master. He's everywhere. Psalm 23 train turns up. Lord's your shepherd. I'll look after you. Toot, toot. Train living to the metropolis of love. If you're in two minds, you'll just, you'll just camp out at the station like a homeless person. But you know, God's quite gracious because if you do miss the Psalm 23 train, you probably catch the Philippians 1 6 train that, 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 that he who began a good work within you, he'll be faithful to not let you down halfway through the journey. Toot, toot. Leaving to the city of kindness. If you miss that, probably a scripture from one of your quiet times will arrive, scrawled on the side of the train. If you miss that, the Hebrews 10, 9 train will turn up, says that God removes the first, that's your old friends, in order to make space for the new friend. Can you see, every, can you see how, how you work? Nothing bypasses the grand central station of your will. We just got to strengthen your will. I know you want to. We're going to have to strengthen your will. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give you, before we pray for people, I'm going to give you four ways to strengthen your will. And uh, way number one is, is, it's stolen from the Spice Girls, right? You've got to know what you want, what you really, really want. No, you do. You want to know what you want, what you really, really want. That's, that's why when you get tempted, you, you, some of you ought to say, Satan, just give me 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Like, it tempts you to pornography. Just give me 10 minutes, Satan. I know it's you. I know I'll enjoy it for a while. But just give me 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes, you can think, what do I really, really want? Do I really want a ruined marriage? Do I really want to live in condemnation, live in guilt, or do I want to live with the smile of God upon my life? That's what, that's what you really, really want, you know. There was an eight-year-old kid who, who came from, was walking home from school, and this frog jumped up on his shoulder, and the frog said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And uh, the kid looked at the frog, you know, and, and the frog looked at him, he just grabbed the frog, put it in his back pocket, carried on walking. The frog squeezed out, jumped back on the shoulder, and uh, said, hey, he said, I kid, I said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into the most beautiful, gorgeous princess. You know? He looked at it, you know, grabbed the frog, put it back, in, and now the frog's mad. The frog jumps out, comes back on his shoulder, and says, hey, kid, I told you, if you kiss me now, right now, I'll turn into a beautiful, gorgeous 
friend says. He says, why won't you kiss me? The kid said, because I, I, I really don't want a beautiful princess. What I want is a, a talking frog. <laughs> you want to know what you want. You, know, you want to know what you really, really want. Otherwise, you're compromising all the time. And your shallow emotions, but your deep emotions, the, the joy, the peace, the righteousness of the Holy Ghost, just dig a well into how, what you really think. Some people say, and Simon Cowell used to say when he was going to sign up a band, shall I, go with my, shall I go with my heart, shall I go with my head? But, but it's not the head that he's talking about. He's saying, shall I go with the shallower part of my heart because you're gorgeous, or the, the deeper part of my heart, is it financially viable? And I think that you need to, to make that decision. That's why Paul said to Timothy, don't lose your head. Don't lose that, that deep inability to know what you really, really want. Number two, you want to become an eco-warrior. You, you want to you become someone that, that, that determines the atmospheric conditions within your mind. You, you know, if you've got a problem with Krispy Kremes, don't live in a bed sit above a Krispy Kreme shop. <laughs> you know, because, because you know, you, you just, whenever you got hungry, even two o'clock in the morning, you think, well, this, in that black bin liner, there's Krispy Kremes in there. <laughs> you know, if you're going to go on a diet, you know, the worst thing you can do is just have all of the biscuits and all of the chocolate that you had when you were, when you were, a slob. <laughs> you, you do want to change the atmospheric conditions around. That's why when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he, 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 only, he removed nine out of the 12 disciples. He said, you guys shoot. I'm only taking three in here because I'm trying to build an atmosphere of expectation, an atmosphere of hope. And I don't know however you do it, but you know, it's better to live a couple of miles from a Krispy Kreme shop because then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to drive there. Plus, you're going to have to break in. It's just a little longer because you built yourself a healthy environment. Put the computer on public view. Turn it around so other people could come past any time to see what's on the computer. Simple thing. My gosh, but you can work out your own configuration to change the atmosphere. Number, number three, change your confession. Change your confession. I, I said last night at Awaken You that the greatest faith word in the Bible is, is the word but. You know, we used to, back in the 80s, we, we used, people used to say, no, I'm, I'm completely healthy. American evangelists, I'm completely healthy. I'm a healing evangelist. They had their oper they flew to Florida to have their operation because they weren't, um, honest and they created a culture of deceit and now we move into the 2020s everyone's just so honest that everyone's got anxiety they got all around their neck I've got ADHD got autism anxiety syndrome everything's a syndrome you know? well I, I would say that, that you want to you want to you want to you want to link present reality with tomorrow's reality, which is the promises of God coming true. You want to you wanna lasso them together. And the way you lasso them together is the word but. You want to say, I'm the, when someone says, how are you going? I'm sick. Sick as a dog. Feeling terrible. The worst I've ever felt for five years. But. See, now, now I'm Lincoln. See, now I'm Lincoln. With the eternal truth of the Word of God, you know, so, you with me, you with me, so, so, you know, it's, a, it's like I'm, I'm letting everybody know I'm having a bad hair day, I'm feeling under the weather, but God's my strength. God. I got, I, I, I got to finish with this one, let me, there's a book out there, it's, it's called The Mind Map. It's called the Tourist Handbook. And inside here is, the, is, is a map of the Christian's mind that I... I'll just show you for a second, just so you think this is going to be good. Hang on a sec. 
There you go. That's, that's the map. I drew that. It's fairly small, right? But this book's available afterwards. It's an analogy. 150 years ago, analogies used to be super popular. The Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis, Lion, the Witch, the World. I'm, I'm just taking you back in time tonight, using an analogy to teach the Word of God. There's some other books there, in, including Man Boobs and Other Human Rights. Okay, here's my last point, right? You wanna, the last point is you want to add a little bit of prayer, right? You want to add a little bit of prayer. If I said a lot of prayer, you go back into religion. Because whenever I pray, I've never prayed enough. So I just, I just say, just to de-stress you, just add a little bit of prayer. And you know, in the, inside my mind, there's some ghost towns. There's, there's a ghost town of depression in me. Because I remember that when somebody said something to me when I was younger, I just used to go inward, right? Inward for maybe a couple of weeks inward. Just, uh, just like into a submarine, no windows. And that city of depression, it's a ghost town. How did it get to be a ghost, ghost town? Well, it, it, I think the tracks were mangled. I think prayer bombed the tracks. Yeah. And so the trains that wanted to go there could no longer go there. The, it had to stop. The tracks are mangled. How do they get mangled? Through the bombs of prayer. That's how, that's how significant it is when you pray. But you know, how, how often am I on a train in the darkened part of my mind? Quite often. You know, hopefully less so now than last year. But that's progress. But you know, if you find yourself, I'll just, if you find yourself on a train in, in the land of darkness, in the fallen region of your mind, have a look out the window. There's a yellow taxi cab of the kindness of God following you. Because the Bible says that his kindness leads us to repentance. Just have a look out the window. You, you think, oh, gee, look, I'm, I'm feeling terrible. I'm sinning and that. No, no, no. Just have a look out the window. Have a look, have a look. Yep, New York yellow taxi cab, the kindness of God, just there. It's just there. Because you're not far from God. It's impossibly far from God. You, you've made that up. It says in Ephesians that, that to do with far from God's standards, but never far from God's presence. Oh, my goodness. You're not far from God. Or all you need to do, you're on a train to nowhere, on a train to self-pity, on a train to lust fill. Yeah, 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 but there's a red button there. Just stand up. Press the red button. Stop the train. Hop off the train. Hop into the cab. Bob's your uncle. Because the cab will take you back to Grand Central Station of your will. We start again now. And how many chances does God give you? A million chances. Because the more chances he gives you, the more opportunities you have to succeed. And so he hands out chances all of the time. It's as simple as that. Repentance isn't you bursting into tears. Repentance is making a decision to change your mind. That's what the word means, to change your mind. So you change your mind. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. It's not complicated. I'll finish with the exact. I'll finish just with the little story. You know, a beautiful mind. You know, Russell Crowe when he was when he was good looking. No, he has. Listen, listen. I'm not being derogatory, but he has changed, hasn't he? Like he has banged on the weight, hasn't he? Oh my gosh. No, he has. I'm just saying that. I'm just. I've, I've got no criticism of it, right? I'm just saying that he has, right? He needs to go on a diet. We want him to live till he's 80. Anyway, so. He's in a beautiful mind. Beautiful mind is, is John's, he, he was acting John Forbes Nash, right? Built brilliant mathematician. And he was employed by the US government to, to find codes in magazines that, that were secret Soviet messages. So he, he's just brilliant. But he was also mad, schizophrenic, paranoid, anxiety. He's just overcome 
all of his life overcome with, with, with maddeningness. Anyway, he finally got the Nobel Prize for economics. This is 40 years later. Gets the Nobel Prize for economics, right? And his mate's been with him. You know, you need a mate. His mate's been with him for, for the last 40 years or so. And his mate says, and I'll paraphrase, because I don't know the exact language, but, but his, his mate said, oh, gee, congratulations. How do, how do you feel now with, with all the voices being gone? Because he, he, was, he was thrilled that he, how do you feel with all the voices? And the camera comes back and you can still see things lurking in the darkened regions. He said, he said oh, no, 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 voices are still there. He said, I've just chosen to ignore them. Oh, that's more than a conqueror, Phil. That's, that's you, full of the muscle power of God. It's not the, it's not the, the, it's not the absence of temptation that makes a man great. It's the resisting of temptation that makes a man great. Oh, my goodness me. Come on, church. Come on, church. The battle belongs to God. We trust in God. Some voices will remain. I've still got two or three monkeys in the head. But they're under control. I've chained them to the train seats. See, some of you always be susceptible, you know, susceptible to depression, but it'll become a ghost town. Susceptible to anxiety, it'll become a ghost. Susceptible to hatred and to bitterness, sarcasm, cynicism, but it'll become a ghost town. Gee, I'm going to do a quick altar call, really quick, because I've gone over, right? I've loved tonight. I've, I've loved talking to you tonight. I've got a good wife praying for me right now, back on the Gold Coast of Australia. You know? <laughs> when you pull down a few things, the Bible says that my weapon, the weapons of my warfare are mighty in God for the pulling down of I've got a feeling I've got some authority in prayer tonight, you know. I'm going to take a radical step here, right? And I'm going to say that there's one city in the fallen part of the mind. You, 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 I'm going to try and make you not embarrassed when you come out, and hopefully there's a good crowd out, right? But there's, there's one city in the fallen part of the mind that, that has subways leading underground to maybe nine or ten other cities. It's, it's, it's called the city of deceit. And I would say in the last 10 years in American culture, lying has become acceptable. And I would say, and you know, sometimes I'm over-exaggerate. So, you know, and that's, that's it's, a, it's just, it's an acceptable form of, you know, it's a little bit white line, but I'm just exaggerating. But sometimes you move into what the British call blagging. You know, my PA used to do that. I said, have you done this? She said, yeah, I've done it, Dave, right? And then she'd go off and do it. You, you know, I mean, that is, you with me, that's crossing the line, but, but it's in this room right now. And I'm not here to condemn, I'm just, I just know that if, if I can crush the city of, of deceit, then I can free up, I can free you up from nine other cities because I can disconnect you from, from nine other cities, you know. My, I'll just, I'll give you an example, then we're going to have a quick altar, right? But my uh, children's pastor phoned me up one, she phoned me up about, about quarter past nine, right? And, uh, and I, you know, I was asleep. So I answered the phone. I, I said, I said uh, you know. Uh. She said, oh, you've you been asleep, Dave? I said, no. <laughs> I started being up for hours. She said, oh, yeah, right, okay. So she carried on the conversation. And when I put the phone down, I thought, oh, gee, I'm a liar. Pants on fire. So I rang her back up. I said, I, I, I lied. I said I was asleep. 
But you know, I, but you know, just to understanding why I said that is because because I, I felt like I wanted to be known as someone who who always got up early to pray. I want to be known as someone on the edge of, uh, you know, someone with, that was totally accountable, someone that, you know what I mean, part of the 5 a.m. club that, you know, gets everything done by 9 a.m. I mean, gosh, you know, good luck with that, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so I, so I do understand because the pressure for me to to feel like I had it, uh, that I had it together when I actually I was so exhausted that I slept in. But you know, me phoning her up, right? So that the form of confession. That shut off the subway to nine other cities. So I'm going to do an altar call, right, to all the liars here. No, I'm going to do an altar call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, you know, uh, you, that's probably a good atmosphere to do it in. But your confession is, is your movement from your seat to the front here. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully it's not just three or four people. Otherwise, we'll be thinking, what's Dr. Matt actually been up to? But hopefully, it's, it, hopefully you know, maybe there's 30 people to come out because then, then it stops us being all judgy. You know, and if you've overcome it, if, if you're such a truth teller and you've overcome your insecurities, right, then you sit there like a goody two-shoes. <laughs> you go ahead and do it, you know. But for the rest of us carnal people, you know, we... I just think tonight, I just, had to, I just had to choose one particular thing. But you know, truth, truth breaks habits. You know, the moment something comes up, truth, truth detoxifies. I just think that some of you lived in a, in a darkened world. You used, to, you used to not telling the exact truth. It's just part of American culture now. It's to lie and not even say that you lied. It's called an untruth. No, it's not. It's called a lie, mate. The Bible never says for those dealing with untruths, stop it. <laughs> Gosh, I preach great. No, I have. No, seriously. Seriously, I have. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Keep standing. You guys stand up as well, right? So time's up, but, but, but we've still got a little bit of time to, to break a stronghold. And, and, uh, and also, I guess we can mix it up a bit, that if you really feel like that there is, uh, you know, there's some towers that are shadowing you right now and really feel like there's some habits that, that you'd like to just to see crushed or at least the window's blown in, you know, just just something that, that deoccupies them, you know, then this is, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to come out to the front and uh, on your marks, get set, go. 10, 9, you can start singing a song. Shout Jesus Eight. from the mountain. Seven. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the dark. So Six. Every enemy. Five. Jesus for my family. I speak the long name. Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus. Say this after me, Lord, dear Lord Jesus. I thank you for the yellow taxi cab of the kindness of God, of the grace of God that chooses not to condemn, that chooses to forgive, that chooses to release me from all condemnation, to forgive me. I choose to press the red button stop this train of deceit, this train of lies, 
of white lies and black lies. Forgive me, Jesus. I repent. Now empower me to be a truth teller, to make truth the foundation of my life, to put on the buckle of truth, to put on the belt of truth, to prevent me from tripping up and from visiting the other cities that I no longer need to visit. Set me free in Jesus' mighty name. Now, just worship God for a few seconds. Come on, just worship God right now. Come on, worship God right now. Worship God right now. Worship God right now. Worship Him. Worship Him. Yeah, come on, let the weight, let the weight, let the weight come on. this auditorium right now. Father, I thank you for the authority invested within me right now, God. Father, I pull down every stronghold of evil, every stronghold, every habitual stronghold, every stronghold that shadows us, every stronghold that follows us. Father God, I pull down the industrial cities. I pull down the royal cities. I pull down the historic cities. Father, cleanse us of all toxins now in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we pull down the city of depression. We pull down the city of anxiety. We pull down the city of lust. We pull down the city of self-pity. Father, tonight, Lord, let victory begin in the house of God. Father God, let your word be the stronghold of our lives and build cities in the new part of our mind to change the skyline so that we can experience God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to give God not a golf clap. We're going to give God a clap offering of victory. On your marks, get set, go. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.